Thank you very much. Hi everyone again and uh, I guess the stage is set uh, for discussing some of the cases of uh, disc edema which may present to you and me. Uh, these are rare by no means but actually just require some bit of little thinking. So we had one 34 year old uh, female actually who presented with blurring of vision in uh, the left eye since 15 days who was moderately obese, had good vision in both the eyes and then pupils uh, showed uh, presence of RFID in the left eye. This is the uh, this picture that uh, uh, we see. And uh, if we see that uh, there is a, a severe discrema in both the eyes with obliteration of the cup here, uh, which is uh, seen actually in the magnified view better. And on visual fields, we see that there was an advanced uh, kind of visual field effect in the left eye and the right eye showed uh, non-specific scrotomas. Uh, neuroimaging was done actually and MRI revealed absolutely everything within normal limits and there was no presence of ventriculomegaly in this case. So she was referred for the neurologist for a further evaluation uh, and the neurologist on, di on evaluation found uh, a diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension on the basis of the CSF opening pressure that they documented to be high. And then one week after she came to us with the severe headache and then she had signs which were suggestive of meningism. She was referred back immediately to the neurologist and on evaluation by a venogram, what we see, if we just compare this to the schematic which we have on the left, what we see is that there is an obliteration of the sinus, there is a flow, uh, the flow is significantly reduced in the superior sagittal sinus which was suggestive of a thrombosis and then of course, here also we see that the transverse uh, sinus also has kind of flow void signal. And then in the sigmoid sinus also there was this thrombosis which is present. So she was diagnosed as a case of cerebral visual venous sinus thrombosis. And she had a risk factor uh, of using uh, the contraceptive pills, but that too very occasionally uh, for a, a gynecological uh, disorder. And then the blood investigations came out to be normal. So the neurologist actually uh, um, treated her with anticoagulation. Initially they tried IV heparin and everything uh, didn't settle. So they had to actually uh, instill some kind of urokinase in the sinus to clear the uh, block. And as we see in the angiogram, uh, the, uh, the sinus is actually perfused, well perfused which was really blocked before the uh, thrombolysis. Here the transfer sinus is also uh, quite well perfused and the sigmoid sinus is also taken care of. So this dilemma actually that sinus venous thrombosis can actually occur in cases of presumed intracranial hypertension. This is something which not was the first time actually this came up. Uh, uh, it, it is well described in literature and in fact two large studies, one uh, from the US group and one from the Arvin group here actually tells us that in about 10% of the cases actually they had uh, this kind of situation in which ultimately they turned out to be cases of sinus venous thrombosis and not uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And actually uh, the uh, findings tell us that it was a combination of the MRI and the MRV actually which could pick up these cases in the study from the US and actually the Owen group uh, had a different scenario in which they can uh, they, they suggested that MRI alone actually picks up around two-thirds of the cases. And the risk factor assessment again, you know, was handy in almost 90% cases uh, from the, uh, the study in ophthalmology. So if we look at it, actually, why is it important to distinguish between the two? The main reason is that IH has a pretty benign course, except, you know, the visual loss and the advanced field effects, which may actually come with time. But the most important thing is that the sinus vision thrombosis is actually can lead to an emergent situation where the stroke and death can even occur. So it's very, very important. And the other thing is that uh, we have to actually think in terms of the management. Management-wise, it's absolutely different in uh, the, both the cases. And the other most important thing which I would like to stress is that there are some underlying factors like infections and malignancies which we can actually miss if we miss sinus venous thrombosis. So this is absolutely mandatory. So we did and relieved the block, but what we lost in the meanwhile uh, of, you know, around six weeks, the patient deteriorated in terms of vision and 
the vision field also actually uh, was quite a bit decreased from what we started with. So we propose that always keep a differential of the sinus venous thrombosis when we deal with all cases of papilledema in spite of normal MRI imaging. So the clinical features may actually be overlapping in these two entities. So IIH really remains a diagnosis of exclusion. That is one actually message we will send across and actually uh, it's mandatory, you know, we have a protocol in which we do a simultaneous MRI and MRV. I would just like to invite the uh, audience views exactly how many of them are actually you know going for a simultaneously MRV uh, in such cases where actually the situation is suggestive, the clinical features are suggestive of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Any views? So it's very less, and I guess there are you know some financial uh, issues also. Uh, Dr. Prem, uh, what do you? Opposed to you. Yeah. So our practice has been to use MRI and MRV in all patients who present with a clinical picture of IIH. And that's for two reasons. One is to detect the uh, venous sinus thrombosis when it is present. But the other, as uh, many of you may be aware, is that there is a high incidence of venous sinus stenosis that we are now finding in many of these patients. And there's some, a lot of debate as to whether it's primary or secondary. But in cases where it is primary, it may give you ultimately the treatment that is necessary for those patients. Sure. Dr. Venkat, uh, you had this situation any time? Uh, like yeah. How often you would say in your long practice? No, I would uh, definitely order MRI and MRV at the same time. So basically you need to write properly to the radiologist is what you are actually looking for and you write the history that the patient has a papilledema, so you're looking for something. And then also as uh, to rule out as a CSVT or a, or a CVST, what you're talking about. In this case, in the first instance, was an MRV done? No, actually, in the first instance, we had referred, but the uh, neurologist probably, you know, did the opening pressures, thinking that it's a classical case, uh, obesity, okay. and uh, no risk factors as right. such. So they did, uh, you know, that CSF analysis and made a diagnosis of IH. Uh, so that was the learning point, yeah, actually. That's right, yeah. So basically, when we are ordering the investigation, at that, that it's instance itself, order for both MRI slash MRV, uh, so that, you know, the radiologist knows what you're uh, basically looking for and do it. Sure. Dr. Ramesh? Uh, I think the only issue here is financial. That's the only issue here. So how to take care, maybe a partial uh, uh, compromise. If given the choice, I would uh, definitely go for both. Sure. But in certain situations where there is a definite risk factor that uh, the patient is obese and you can see that from that, that there is a rapid uh, weight gain over a period of time, and if they don't have any risk factors like OCP, if they have OCP uh, as a risk factor means they also have a risk factor for sinus venous thrombosis. In that kind of cases, I think definitely we need to get. I think probably a certain kind of clinical features as you are taking history can give a clue to go for MRV or MRI because it, it's not so easy for across the country to get uh, everything, MRI and MRV, which is desirable even from the papers, even if it is 10%, you are detecting one case of CSVT out of 100 patients of IH, which I think it's a great uh, thing. Uh, it's a high risk, I would say. Sure. As a continuation to the same point, financial interest. So if you have financial compromise, so can we do only MRV? Suppose you have risk factors, and how sure you are if you do only MRV, because you are looking at MRI to rule out any compressive lesion. So can we get away with only MRV? Doing an MRI, MRV, MRI, MRV. Let's say if you are doing an MRI with a contrast, the contrast adds up by three thousand rupees. Okay, I think probably you can talk to the radiologist and you can actually form a kind of a package where you can do an MRI and an MRV, and uh, you know substantially kind of you know cut down on the cost. I'm not sure how much the uh, MRI and MRV cost. I'm just asking it you. Depends you know. on the centers. Some yes, centers that's absolutely right. Different. So, so each one charges their own rates are there. So, yeah. I think yeah, I guess wherever you are comfortable with the radiologist, you need to talk to them and then you know at the device a package and you uh, just write this protocol to be followed, and then they just do like let's say for for me means I face this kind of a problem when we order MRI head and orbits. Uh, in, in, in Hyderabad, they build both for head and orbits. Yeah. You know, when you build both for head and orbits, it, it comes to ten to 12,000. And you add contrast on them, it comes another 3,000 more. 
So what the radiologist, uh, I, I mean, I do is basically, I mean, they have devised a protocol, what we call a visual pathway protocol, where they do orbits also and the head also. And in a package of, uh, let's say, eight to 10,000, you know, uh, including the contrast. So it's like that. I think in this particular case, is the patient was referred to a neurologist for MRV as well as a CSF opening pressure. Despite of that, the, the neurologist started the patient on Diamox, which we need to be sensitized that uh, we need to think because the, the lady was very thin, no other risk factor. Uh, she was uh, taken this OC pills just for a few occasions. That may not be a risk factor. So that's one more aspect I think you need to uh, keep it in mind. Uh, one thing I just want to say, can you go back to the uh, fields? Yeah. No, the, just before this, you had shown those fields where she yeah, progressed. Yeah, sure. uh, this, is, I think, is a very good indicator for doing an optic nerve sheet decompression. The first uh, thing. Because this patient, when he actually presented, if you see the left eye, I mean, the eye which is involved had constricted visual fields. So at that time, because uh, when you're talking about giving treatment for the condition, hmm. by the time the pressure comes down, it's going to be too late and the eye disease is going to progress. The visual feeds will continue progressing. Sure. So this could be a good indicator for doing an ONSD at the time. I would not say that ONSD is the primary thing which you do for any patient with papilledema. But in this particular, for that eye, where you see the constricted visual fields, you could have done it as a, you know, that could have been yeah. an, uh, because we have done cases where we have done ONSD for such things. And you actually see the fields are progressing. Like if you look at that field, after an ONSD, it has progressed. I mean, it has regressed back to the up field. It's actually gone back. Sure. So in this case, the ONSD could be an, uh, simultaneously have done with the uh, treatment of that. Point is well taken, actually. So just moving on, actually, we had another uh, uh, middle-aged uh, person who actually came with uh, kind of bilateral visual loss. And that was something which he just uh, discovered when he just woke up in the morning after about an hour. And he said uh, categorically that he just progressed over 6 to 8 hours. The anterior segment was essentially within normal limits. Pupils were 5 millimeters, both eyes. Sluggishly, uh, they were not really reacting to the light. And this is what actually the person had. Uh, there was a kind of uh, nasal blurring of the disc. Uh, which was seen actually in both the eyes. Pretty symmetrical picture. And there was a kind of a, a swelling, cloudy swelling of the uh, nerve fiber layer which was just extending on the vascular arcades. And when we just see it on the red free, uh, we can just give in, uh, get an indication how the nerve fiber just swells up uh, in this case. So basically uh, what we were actually having was a profound visual loss with bilateral subtle disc edema. Uh, with nerve, nerve fiber swelling along the arcades and what we thought was that probably it could be a case of atypical papillitis thinking the uh, profound visual loss or it could be an atypical kind of ischemic optic neuropathy because of the sudden onset uh, especially when he woke up in the morning or it could have been a resolved uh, kind of artery occlusion. So we actually ordered uh, uh, immediate angiography and what we found was that with the ret arm retina time was uh, within normal limits and there was no gross feeling, there was no gross AV transit. So virtually ruling out a case of an arterial lottery op occlusion in this case. So we thought that there was something amiss and, and that's why we just probed him and we actually found out that actually he was a routine user of sildenafil citrate and last night he had actually taken almost 100 milligrams. That was almost the double uh, the dose actually what is recommended uh, uh, in, in these cases. And uh, he was an occasional alcohol uh, uh, user, but uh, no really uh, binge of alcohol uh, in the past uh, immediate history. So we uh, did an electrophysiology and found that ERG was essentially normal. The VEP actually showed uh, prolonged latency. In fact, pattern VEP was extinguished. The uh, no presence of subretinal fluid on the OCT. And on the RF analysis, we can see the thinning of the uh, nerve fiber layer in the superior and inferior quadrants. And if we just trace the literature, actually, the sildenafil citrate, it actually potentiates the action of the nitric oxide, thus leading to vasodilatation. And if we just uh, recount the uh, reported literature about the sildenafil side effects, we will find that it, 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 it may just cause a transient uh, blue vision or uh, it has been reported to cause increased light sensitivity. And the other major thing which has been reported widely is that in some cases actually it may just cause kind of ischemic optic neuropathy and that association uh, would be uh, maybe find some vascular occlusions as well. So if you just understand uh, the basic pathology is that you know the optic nerve ischemia actually results and 
the uh, th- uh, the perfusion from the uh, uh, post- the posterior ciliary arteries which perfuse the optic nerve head that may be impaired in these cases and actually what sildenafil does uh, can uh, it's not really proven but what they propose is that by decreasing the kind of uh, by causing some kind of hypotension especially when it actually is taken in the night it can lead to an aggravation of the physiological nocturnal hypotension thus making uh, the person more susceptible to ischemic optic neuropathy and the other thing is that when we have uh, the uh, the optic nerve head it has some kind of auto regulatory mechanism which might be dis- uh, disturbed by actually the increased nitric oxide levels causing uh, some kind of vasospasm there and this actually can again lead to ischemic optic neuropathy so we actually uh, referred the patient to physician who actually did all the assessment and found that there was nothing really amiss there the person also had a normal neuroimaging because the person had presented with a profound visual loss we uh, uh, went ahead with an ivmp therapy to really take care of the optic nerve uh, which were severely uh, damaged in this case and uh, unfortunately in spite of the uh, uh, the course of the steroids the person uh, hardly could manage a very marginal improvement in vision and he was referred uh, for further the interesting aspect to note here is that as we just followed up the patient actually you can see that within 5 days how the changes occur you can see the gross nerve fiber layer atrophy how does it occur uh, how does the pallor progress in 2 months actually it becomes a diffuse pallor in spite of your uh, best uh, Uh, effects and the same is uh, replicated in the other eye and the nerve fiber layer also actually just uh, shows us how uh, you know the now the atrophy can occur and over a period of time it's basically the diffuse pallor which just remains so what we think is that in this case uh, considering the segmental involvement uh, which the person had and he had a small cup distortion in the one of the eyes and there is a known association of sildenafil which has been widely reported uh, uh, causing the nia1 but what actually uh, is not really in favor is that he had an adequate cup distortion in the other eye there was no classical pallid disc edema or a nerve fiber layer hemorrhage entity in this case and it also does not explain the profound visual loss and this patient does not had any vascular risk factors which actually leads to really a diagnosis of ischemic optic neuropathy so we also actually entertain that probably you know something else uh, kind of an atypical papillitis uh, kind of a toxic effect uh, may actually be relevant in this situation because of the uh, profound visual loss that we had uh, uh, but the only thing is that the patient did not respond uh, unfortunately uh, to the steroid uh, course normally which in many cases they do so the take home message uh, probably would be that rule out you know uh, things like uh, sildenafil intake actually in these cases which present with acute uh, painless visual loss uh, especially when you, the person is in that age group and the exact mechanism is not known but a combination of say ischemic optic neuropathy or the optic neuropathy may actually be working in these cases so we recommend that probably you know uh, uh, with these uh, with this case and background actually it's too early but then a person who you know who has erectile dysfunction or you know in female sometimes they started for pulmonary artery hypertension we may actually ha- uh, recommend some kind of screening of the crowded disc Uh, and especially when the person is having uh, a vascular risk factors any experience uh, anybody from the audience had such a case uh, and you try to really elicit that kind of sildenafil history yeah can you just come to the mic please yeah uh, so uh, yeah i have a question about the sildenafil therapy because uh, i had one patient sure who used that and next morning he had multiple hemorrhages okay just yes, hemorrhages started all over the retina all okay. over the retina okay but no disc swelling sure okay uh, anyone from the panel had this kind of situation uh, i didn't have anything like this but uh, the place which i work is uh, associated with a heart hospital so usually they send us to uh, patients basically for children who are under treatment they get sit in a fill so they send it as a regular screening to us to check so we do baseline tests and then we keep them following up every 3 months sure. but i have not seen but important point here is that uh, it's very difficult to elicit an history from a patient whether he is taking it so that has to be handled like many times you would see an naion naion but you will not be able to because they would never reveal that they are doing so this it comes a little issue here how would you be able to get it out from the patient that he is actually taking sure i don't know if this 
gets into the entity, there's an entity called as a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, yeah. where you won't have uh, this lid swelling and everything, but you have a painless loss of vision, an acute painless loss of vision. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, you know, this could be that, but um, we have seen patients who uh, probably if retro, retrospectively, if I think, or maybe we didn't take the history of Sildenafil, but which was not being used in those days. Uh, I'm talking about, let's say, five to six years back. Sure. Uh, we had patients who had uh, typical history like this, painless loss of vision, investigated everything. Everything came out normal. And they didn't improve in the vision after, despite being treated with intravenous methylprednisolone. I mean, do they fit into a category of a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy? Possibly, yes. And the only, uh, just to complete, uh, actually, in posterior ischemic, uh, so the only thing is that probably the findings that we had in terms of viscedema and the pallor, you know, within the first week, that's a little uh, rare because in four to six weeks, the pallor sets in that way. Sure. Yeah, you know, that is one factor. Somebody's disc may have like that, where uh, you know you can have a little bit of nerve fiber layer being like that, thicker nerve fiber layer with normal vision. You know, absolutely. And then, but you you saw them when there was a loss of vision. Yeah. And then, but nothing fitted into that. Absolutely. Because there's nothing uh, suggesting you know like there's a non-arthritic ischemic optic neuropathy. Yeah. Looking at the disc as such. Yeah, absolutely. And VEP is pro prolonged latency. Yes, yeah. prolonged latency is there. Or is it an extinguished VEP? No, it's a pattern is extinguished and the uh, the flash was uh, having a prolonged latency. But sometimes, you know, you never know because if you look at the optic neuritis treatment trial group, um, and about I would say about less than 3% of the patients never improved in their vision, uh, in, despite, you know, being treated, uh, especially the bilateral ones. Sure. Usually the unilateral ones are the common ones, uh, but the bilateral ones fall into category of 10 to 15%. And that too, some of them have never improved beyond uh, 2200 or 2400 vision despite everything uh, uh, being done in them. So we, and these are some of the tough ones to crack it. Thanks. So, yeah. Yeah. Do we have time? Or? Sure. I think uh, we have some more cases uh, and we can just discuss afterwards, but uh, probably we'd like to stick to the time actually. Yeah. In the interest of time, we should stop yeah. here.